Before we start with today's video, I wanted to let you quickly know that our Workspaces and People series from New York, our season one is finished with New York and we're currently working on the next one, which is Amsterdam. We took it already a couple of uh, days ago. It was super interesting. We had many, many talks. We met nice people. We saw a lot of spaces. So there's, I think, 10 to 12 videos or something like that coming up. In the meantime, because it's always for us about spaces, but also about relationships, I wanted to share this interview with Fabian that we took in New York, which was kind of the meeting after the meeting, which to me is always the moment when the magic happens. And he talked about relationship, relationship cleaning. I think it was super interesting. So enjoy this one and the next season will come out soon. We just recorded a video on um, community building with Fabian. It was super interesting, very inspiring to listen to you. Thank you so much for sharing again. And uh, in the meeting after the meeting, how it always is, uh, we found out there's another topic that is um, also very, very worth sharing, um, which is conflict. How do you deal with conflict? How do you deal with feedback in companies, in communities? And yeah, what are, what are your, your thoughts? Every group has conflicts. It's not, there's, I've, never, I've never been part of, I've never worked with a group that never at some point had conflict. If a group stays together, if a group like actually is together, at some point there will be conflict. So I assume that's a very normal thing. That's a healthy thing, that's totally okay. The question is, does the group have the tools to work through that? And my observation is that at the moment, in most workplaces, there is no structure to actually work through conflict. HR is not considered a safe space, mm -hmm. a safe place to work through conflicts in most organizations mm -hmm. because they represent the employer and not the employee in most places. And so if we assume that conflict will arise, how do you deal with it? And I think most people right now are left to themselves to, to deal with their conflict. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's necessarily the best way to do that. I think a lot about group hygiene. Like, how do you cleanse the things that come up, right? It's like, good thing comes up and bad things come up and you just have to find a way to cleanse through I'm, that. I'm, I'm sure the, you know, little cannons that I put on at home and like, you know, wipe out the room doesn't exactly. work in this. But that's normal. Like, we, it's, it's, we assume stuff when we use it gets dirty and we have to like keep it in order. Same as with relationships, same as with people, you know, and with groups. And um, yeah, and, and I'm really surprised how most organizations t just lack any structure for, for conflict resolution at the moment. And on a community side, there are a lot of tools there for communities, uh, for, for groups to resolve conflicts. Um, first of all, you have to define in advance if a conflict arises, how you deal with it. Number two, small groups are much better to deal with conflicts than like larger groups. Like if you have, I'm not sure, if you're an office of 200, you can't like, resolve a conflict with everyone what's your unit of change um, and again like we briefly talked before about what if you had a small group that you could talk about these things and i think for me this really brings up this idea of a safe space mm -hmm. like we need safe spaces for um, not just professional stuff like things that are not going well at work but most of us also have sometimes um, personal stuff we're working through and does that affect our performance at work? Of course it does. I think this is a total illusion that, that our work lives and our um, personal lives are totally separate. Of course they're not. And, um, and so we need spaces um, where we can bring those in. And I call those safe spaces and ideally not just safe, but also brave spaces mm -hmm. where I can be vulnerable and brave enough to talk about what's not going well at, at home, what's maybe not going well at work. Um, but that needs um, confidentiality, that needs trust, that needs a commitment. That need, I need to know if we are a group, I need to know you're not going to talk to this with other people. I need to know that you actually care about me. I need to know that um, there's a continuity in this conversation, that this is not just a one-off because why would I um, open up so deeply and show you my whole heart and then you just walk away. So there's different elements that are really necessary to be put in place but why I'm very excited about this because they're not rocket science. They're very simple, they're very basic um, and, um, 
And I think it's very possible to create these safe spaces and brave spaces in, in organizations. Just right now, most organizations don't do that. Do you have an example of um, a conflict and how you went through it with what size of people and like, is there something that comes to your mind? Yeah, I mean, I'm um, one of the communities I'm involved in right now is it's a little meta. It's a community of community builders. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been bringing together um, community builders from all over the world. And the whole group is about is 26 people. Mm -hmm. And we broke the larger group into smaller units mm -hmm. of four to five people. Mm -hmm. And with the smaller unit, we talk every three weeks. Mm -hmm. We just talk for about two hours. We check in with each other. And there, I mean, it's very normal that um, people bring in stuff that um, where they have challenges in their in their daily lives, um, and we're trying to be that group that helps them to to work through that. Um, the most important thing that we can provide is a place to listen, um, where we just listen with an open heart and an open mind, um, and then we provide mirroring. We say, "Oh, th this is what we heard." Um, without judgment, this is kind of what we're hearing and what you do. Um, and I think also a very important part is like we try not to give advice. I think that's another element that's really important as part of groups um, to provide a mirror, but not to provide advice. Because share experience. Exactly, share an experience, but don't don't <coughs> not sharing advice because advice can very feel like top creates down. a power imbalance and top down. Exactly. Mm -hmm. What are the? Do you have like guidelines for feedback for dealing with? Um, fuck ups, mistakes, like do you have like five or six or whatever, you know, okay, listen, first thing is you share it openly or... Can you help me better understand your question? Um, do you have, so we have, we found that for meetings, for example, we have guidelines how to have a meeting, right? Yep. You don't you interrupt each other, you be there on time, you um, only involve the people that have to be there, you don't do it longer than you actually need it, so we don't do our meetings, but only 25 meetings. So we have guidelines for everything. We have guidelines for um, bringing our dogs to the office, for example. Um, but sometimes I feel like there's no guidelines for giving feedback and um, cleaning relationships maybe like hi, you called it hygiene hygiene to hygiene relationships mm -hmm. um, do you have guidelines for that like yeah that's important what do we look at yeah um, yeah there, there's definitely best practices there and I think um, I can tell you some concrete best practices now I think in general um, the important thing is that a group when it starts out has to decide for themselves what they want these rules to be. Mm -hmm. I can tell you some best practice, but I think every every group should at the beginning define it, mm -hmm. so that it's not. Ideally, you have already figured out these these uh, things before the conflict arises. When it comes to feedback giving, I think um, training people in deep listening, like listening, is a skill that you can do better or worse. Um, I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. I think um, there are different skills out there. There's um there's a a practice called Theory U um, that is one of these um, and a, a structured approach to to true deep listening. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, there's a format called case clinics, mm -hmm. how people can bring in challenges into a group and how they can work through that. Um, so there's different best practices that are out there um, and they're all like open source and they're all openly available. I've been thinking a lot about what leadership means in in the work environment of the future. Mm -hmm. And I think traditionally leadership is classically top-down leadership. Mm -hmm. Like I have a vision and then I translate that vision and then I, I, it goes down the pyramid. Mm -hmm. And my sense is by working with communities and with groups that uh, we are in need of a new type of leadership. A leadership from within instead of from top-down. Mm -hmm. A leadership that is trained in facilitation, that is trained in listening, mm -hmm. that is trained in enabling others and like sharing power um, and, and, and giving power versus like holding power. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and I think a lot of workplaces right now, that's kind of one of the key challenges. They also train their leaders in a very old school model. Mm -hmm. um, and if, you, if the people in charge and in power are, are like, have these like old concepts in mind, that just then trickles Untouchable. out. Untouchable. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, um, and I think that's a really core question to ask. I don't have the answer, but I have a, have a question in my mind, like what does that leadership from within look like, you know? Um, um, and, 
I know that the current leadership model is not working for a lot of organizations, but I don't see a lot of organizations being critical about that and really asking themselves um, what it would mean from a relationship point of view and from a community point of view. I read an article the other day and I loved the headline, which is in German, so sorry, we'll translate it for you. Ein guter Chef, oder ein Chef heute, ein guter Chef führt nicht, sondern fühlt. Mm. And I thought that was... A good boss doesn't lead, he feels, he, he senses. He feels, he senses mm -hmm. um, relationships. I mm -hmm. thought that was so powerful. That's exactly so, it. Yeah. I think that's exactly it, because I think which, which, which leadership curriculum these days have sensing and feeling as part of it. And, you know, part of that is also kind of the male-female like thing. Like, I think, you know, a, a lot of like um, leadership cultures are so male-dominated. Um, but I think the female, females, I think, are much stronger at sensing, at feeling, at kind of under, like, can also like put a sense to the unspoken. Um, and that's another reason why like balanced leadership teams make so much sense, you know, um, because that skill is so, so important. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, Again. thank you. Before you leave, there is a video for you to watch as a recommendation by YouTube. Here you can subscribe, make sure you subscribe because we publish minimum two videos a week about new workspace, new work, the tools that you need behind that and all the stuff behind digital transformation. I would be thrilled if you subscribe here.